aesthetic as well as uh, improved stations. Um, so those are some exciting developments that will be uh, there for no matter what happens, what else happens on the quarter. And I think you know people need to see some progress. Uh, and so uh, these will be good things and create some transportation hope. We need to keep transportation hope alive. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, and I'll be sitting in all meeting and listening and answering any questions if there's anything uh, that I need to do. Do you think? Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, my name is John Culpa, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. And thank you all very much for, um, for joining our committee. And it's a really an exciting and important project. So we're looking forward to working with you over the coming months as we move forward. Um, maybe we go around the table and introduce ourselves quickly. So we all kind of know we're going to be working Stefano on that. Um, I have a civil engineering degree. I'm also a financial advisor. And I work with a couple of cities. I done a little bit of uh, studies in the Metro Medellin and Metro Caracas, so I kind of have a background in that. Hal Feldman, I live in Palmetto Bay. I'm president of the Palmetto Bay Business Association, and generally I just keep my nose into various things that are happening civically <coughs> and make sure that I uh, broadcast and communicate that information out to the public. So I'm glad to be part of this. Uh, Rene Infante. Redland Market Village, and chairperson of the Economic Development Council. Hi, Chief Tornich. Uh, I live along <coughs> the, the route, as well as I'm an architect in Miami-Dade County. Uh, I've specialized in some urban design and planning and work on a lot of high-density projects. My name is Steve Zarzaki. I am the president of the Concerned Citizens of Copper Bay. I am. I have a 30-year career, now retired as a professional engineer in the state of Florida. Although transportation and traffic is not my area of expertise, I believe that I can bring an engineering uh, attitude towards uh, uh, this group. I am uh, Junior Santana. I represent uh, Color Bay, and my only take uh, in here is that I've been suffering for two years of public transportation, so that's why I'm here. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. My name is Monica Cejas. I'm with the Department of Transportation and Public Works, and I am responsible for bringing you the SMART plan, including the South Bay Corridor. Good evening. My name is Johnny Farias. I am Council Member for South Bay Community Council Number 15. I'm also an electrical contractor in Miami-Dade County and a concerned citizen. Good evening. My name is Julian. Danny Iglesias, I'm here representing CTAC, which is the Citizens Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, Barry White, I'm the chairman of the Summer Citizens Committee, but I am here as a citizen and activist, uh, uh, an activist standard. Uh, Nikki McGuire, I'm the executive director of the Historic Seminole Theater in Homestead. I'm here on behalf of the city of Homestead, and I don't know anything about how trains work, but I like to ride with this. <laughs> Tim Forbes, um, <coughs> chairperson of the Miranda Citizen Advisory Committee, and also Commissioner Mark Cooper. Thank you. I'm Suzanne Fendry Bonner, and I'm here on behalf of the Mayor Flynn. And we have people in the audience from um, the TPO in particular, uh, uh, who are uh, big supporters of the transit, uh, transit the smart plan, the transit development plan. Um, a couple of our, our own colleagues, Andrew, um, obviously Therese and her staff with, with our team. Um, and we also have Alex David with Calvin Giordano, who is doing a land use visioning study that also just kicked off today. Um, and he's here to also observe, and if there's any questions that, that are particular to the land use visioning process, uh, he'd be happy to help and, and uh, we can engage in that. So, uh, before you, you have um, a couple of packages or uh, components, but uh, primarily we gave you this uh, project status recap. Um, and what we are hoping to do today, yeah, I think we'll try that. It's going to 
see how that works. Because it gets pretty dark in here. <laughs> you also have Carla Bing. Oh, and Carla, yes, of course. Our, I'm sorry. Public it's public information officer. Wow, well, and this is a public meeting, right? Yeah, it's really dark. Okay. Um, so we wanted to first give you basically an introduction to the materials that we're going to cover in the public meetings in October. And that's that's our hope for for getting through with you all of the materials that we'll cover, give your input. Um, and for the sake of those who maybe who didn't attend, one of the first uh, things that we have is this project status. And um, this is the same as the handouts that you basically had before you. Um, where we talk about the purpose of the project development and, and environment study that we, were, we undertook in May. And we had our kickoff meeting in May um, and have been working ever since to work on the different PD project components, which include uh, getting through the various elements of the environmental and engineering and planning phases of the project. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's kind of two components here. We're doing the pd and &E study, and Calvin Giordano has just been engaged by the TPO to uh, develop the land use visioning effort. So we're talking about the South Corridor as part of the SMART plan, and that's the shaded area in yellow. And we are looking at the potential of trans enhanced transit service from the Dayland South Station all the way south to Florida City. Uh, we are working with the, within the existing South Bay Transitway. Uh, it's there today. The idea is to improve it, make it better. Um, and we'll be basically traveling across large areas of unincorporated Dade County as well as the five uh, cities and villages along the bay, uh, along the way. There's been a lot of work done, so we did not want to reinvent the wheel. So we have basically taken the process and advanced it a little bit further than a normal pd &E study by taking advantage of a lot of the work that was done in the South Bay Advantage Lane study, the, the previous South Link study update, and these various other efforts that go back for 20 years or more, um, at least along this corridor, where transit's been a component of, of and thought about for, for quite a long time. Um, so we've basically uh, in, initiated this project and we're working on a very fast track to really catch up to the other corridors that the Florida Department of Transportation started to advance about a year earlier. And so our goal is to try to catch up to basically the same time frame early next year. Of course, public engagement, data collection, and data analysis, we're, we're doing that as, as part of our overall study effort. And um, we're documenting the existing conditions. We're evaluating alternatives. Um, we're taking a stab at where stations should be and could be located, um, as well as how to improve overall mobility connectivity throughout the entire corridor. And it's a very diverse corridor, as you all represent each of your areas. It's, it's very clear that, that what, what fits for Pinecrest doesn't necessarily fit for Homestead. And there's, there's differences along a 20-mile corridor in, in any situation. And uh, we need to be sensitive and account for that as we, as we do our study. So we basically, as I mentioned, we, so we're not starting with 40 or 50 alternatives. So sometimes you get really large numbers of all these possibilities. We kind of narrowed it down when we started the, the study to have four basic alternatives. An extension of the metro rail system at grade. So it would come down like it, the tail tracks today go down to 98th Street, and they are at grade already. And the idea would be to extend that all the way down. An at grade rapid transit service using, uh, and this is what Frank alluded to, where we would have um, a vehicle that emulates rail, but it would be, uh, wouldn't require all of the infrastructure that goes with the heavy rail extension in terms of the overhead wires and the, and the power substations and things like that. So it could be done more, effect, more efficiently um, and, and be more cost effective. And at grade light rail transit, since light rail is definitely one of the things that has been considered in the past and there's a real interest on this car. And so we're looking at a, at a fully at grade, but a new type of vehicle, a light rail transit vehicle. And then a connected and autonomous vehicle alternative. And again, Frank mentioned where we're looking to the future uh, things are changing very quickly in the transportation world and autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, things like that are actually becoming um, very realistic in, in the coming years. The question is how long? Uh, 
Commissioner Cobb this morning was wondering how long is it going to be. Well, I think we'll, we are already seeing the start of that kind of a revolution in technology since we can now buy a car that parks itself. Um, but there's, it's a continuum. It's going to take time. It's not going to be overnight. But you know, having an alternative like that does does make some sense. So that's sort of a, a, a recap of where we've been, and we've had a lot of public engagement. We had the kickoff meeting. We've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with a lot of key city staff. We've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with key individuals, some of you around the table here. And um, we can, we'll continue that engagement process throughout um, as we go forward. And as uh, both Commissioner Frank mentioned, at the end of the month, October 23rd and 25th, are our next public events and the Carter workshops that will be held at the Falls Mall and at the Southland Mall right here nearby. So uh, those are those are what we're hoping to get through the materials for today with you. Um, and so the goal of our overall study is to select the locally preferred alternative that ever all the communities can buy into as the alternative that will move forward for the South Carter. And, and that's really what, what our goal is here. We're still early on in the process, but um, yeah, we're definitely making progress. And um, like, can I make a comment? Sure. Just as to the outside gate of 2019, one of the things that we're working on is how to push that. Is how to push it closer. Closer, right. which is some hurdles with FDOT and Florida Department of well, Florida Department and federal. And then the federal transit to see how right. they certain of the studies can be shortened and how we can add review personnel. So so the idea is to move it into 2018. Right. So possibly. in order to inform that a little bit further, the SDA actually told us in July that we could get, we in fact would have to do no more environmental analysis if we were to keep this as a bus rapid transit solution, as a bus-based system. If we take the path of having a light rail alternative or, or heavy rail extension, they would require an environmental assessment, and that's a minimum of two years. So that's where the float in the schedule comes from. Are there any other questions about that part of where we've been? General thoughts? You can turn the lights on. I don't know. Um, I noticed that any consideration of the elevated uh, portion or total uh, system is on the table, and that asked me, uh, makes me ask the question, how many crossings of the grade level are there in that corridor, and yeah. how are they going to be handled, and what is the current travel time from beginning to end with the existing vehicles, and what is the uh, proposed travel time for each different alternative that they're offering, how will that change? Okay. Uh, we are not considering the elevated, a fully elevated system because it's just too expensive. It would be well over a couple of billion dollars. Even if I may, that may be true, number one. Number two, I only pushing, but I'm curious. Um, to my knowledge, no one has ever fully evaluated the actual cost an elevated system in the existing uh, situation. We've already bought the land, we own it, we don't have to buy right away, and everybody's doing it by comparison. So I, I would, with all due respect, say that I'm appalled that it's not a part of this study to really put the numbers to that option, including the possible just to do it option where you have to go over at the grade crossing, because my main concern is the safety. Still, you have not eliminated the people crossing those all of those many uh, at grade crossings. There's 56 of them. Only six. 56. 56. And to and I don't care if it costs a few billion dollars. You're investing in the future of 2,200 square mile, over three million population density. So if it costs a few billion, so what? You got to invest money at some point. Somebody's made a decision that you can't afford it, it won't work. That, to my knowledge, to, to my way, that's not what this study should be about. You have to go to the base 
and build up and eliminate those things uh, before you do it out of hand. Okay. Well, we're going to be doing the cost estimate, and we do still include the potential, and I think I didn't mention it earlier, but you'll see it in, in our workshop on the stations, we still have the potential to do the grade separations uh, at individual locations. By doing the rise and fall? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, I have a few comments, too. I agree with Mr. White. Um, however, if alternative four is off the table, then I'm not here. I will leave. Um, alternative four, for those who uh, don't remember, is elevated metro rail to Southland Mall and bus continuing down to Homestead. The reason that I can take from all of the plans that I have read is that Alternative 4 was um, discarded uh, because, in my opinion, of misleading statements in the plan. The plan stated uh, that um, uh, US-1 has been widened to its fullest extent. This is not true south of Southland Mall. US-1 is four lanes south of Southland Mall and can easily be widened to six lanes. In addition to that, uh, the turnpike is four lanes south of Southland Mall and can be widened to many more than six lanes as we are seeing now in Cutler Bay. And of course, Chrome Avenue is currently being widened. Uh, so, so and my count by, by Google Earth is that there are 46 road crossings over the busway between Dadeland and Florida City, averaging 0.4 miles apart. This means that given the same frequency of, of uh, transit uh, uh, as we have on Metro Rail today, there'll be as many as 480 at grade light rail trains crossing over each of these roadways every day. Um, this, would, this would impact traffic horribly. As I see it, based on an average speed and a, that frequency, uh, each grade crossing would need to be closed for the trains to pass as long as 18 minutes every hour. Now, I haven't seen any traffic impact pl pl uh, studies that, that, that clearly, accurately, and honestly uh, uh, take this into account and present what this would cost in terms of congestion on US-1. And, and we haven't even started to talk about at-grade crossings, where the gate has to come down and the, and the lights flash and the, and the bells ring. Um, these, these crossings would have to be coordinated with the lights on US-1 so that the queues over the, cro over the rail could clear prior to each one of these 480 trains coming through. So any, any chance of timing the lights on US-1 is gone, and we're now adding more delay to US-1. Um, haven't even spoken about what impact at grade is going to have on safety. Uh, the US Department of Transportation uh, defines something called an exposure index, which is the product of number of trains per day and number of cars per day that meet at intersections. Um, they they, um, they uh, uh, say that any, any exposure index greater than 48,000 indicates grade separation feasibility. Um, if you look at any of these crossing roads, uh, some, some of the um, uh, average daily transport, uh, uh, trans transportation are in the order of 33,500 at Southwest 152nd uh, Street. That's 33,000 cars per day. And if you multiply that times 480 trains per day, you get absurdly high exposure index, which almost guarantee that we're going to have a high incidence of train slash car collisions. 
any at grade solution, in my opinion, will be a catastrophe and will be worse than we have now. I, I'm going back now to alternative four. The reason that we dropped uh, 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 elevated metro rail all the way to Florida City is because it was too expensive. It cost, according to the smart plan, $1.1 billion. Not, maybe, maybe that's been upgraded now. Um, the, the preferred local uh, uh, alternative, as I know it today, is at-grade light rail. The, the, the um, estimate for that cost is $640 million, about half of the elevated. So what will plan alternative four do? Alternative four is half, less than half of the elevated uh, 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 metro rail going from Dadeland to Southland Mall. So it will cost less than half of that $1.1 billion, which brings us right down into the 640 million, which the county tells us is acceptable. So we've, we've actually not ruled out any alternative of combining a portion of the corridor with one technology and having another technology on the other yeah. part of the And corridor. John, Thanks. that is really unacceptable. When you put a community south of Southland Mall and a second degree of citizenship or of, of, of economic development, is the strong. We contribute to half a penny. Now we have a, a paper here saying that if I uh, support half a penny more, half a penny of you is worth the same as mine. So what I'm proposing here is a unified system that is worth and equal for everyone in the future. We're talking about the future, Mr. White. I agree with you. We ought to consider an investing in South Dade for once in our lifetime. We should do it correctly. And in order for us, most of the, of the uh, larger developments are going to take place on the US-1 corridor unincorporated areas. So what are we doing? Let's, let's really wait until we, we see it all. But I will go ahead and, and put my, my money on a system that is integrated and equal for everyone. Sure. I don't think anybody's considered an elevated road on the whole corridor for use by BRT, whatever we call it, by buses. And then you could have ramps at different parts along that roadway to access along the roadway from wherever it's uh, appropriate. So if you had an elevated roadway, not a metro system, for the, for the buses, you've, solved a lot, you've brought the cost down for sure, and you're using the buses, which are more flexible and can be driven by gas or economically. You know, I, don't, I don't even, uh, you know, that I don't see where that's even been considered. The challenge is elevating anything is expensive, honestly. And if you're going to elevate, if you were to elevate, then, then just build Metro Rail. I mean, that would be the logical thing to do if, if it wasn't, yeah. I agree, and we are running the numbers on all of these alternatives. So we're not making any decisions at this stage. The decision is going to be made by the CTO when we get through our studies. And I'm hopeful that we can get to some consensus. We need to, need to these are all completely valid arguments, absolutely everything you said. Um, but we need to find that sweet spot of where we can get our, all of your communities in general agreement that this is the right path forward with a project that's affordable and, and frankly that, that can be submitted to the Federal Transit Administration, um, Florida DOT, and get the funding that's required for it because all of these projects cost an awful lot of money, even, even, the, even the most cost effective ones. Yeah, well, I have a question. You, you mentioned before you ended the presentation that if we do um, anything but the um, extended bus, we will be waiting for two years for more environmental assessments. Correct. So the options you have here, which is the Agri Metro Rail, all of these will require the more time. Take more time. So what kind of option are you giving us then? 
Well, you've got four options out there. There's four alternatives. We're not uh, and all, prejudging but, that. But you'll come with a two-year wait. But it will right. entail more time. Okay. Well, I mean, we we got to wait another two years. I mean, um, we've been investing in rate. I mean, they, they're talking about investing into our future. We've been investing in rate. I mean, I, I recall the the, two, the half cent pay tax. Right. So we've already been investing to further. So yeah, and I'm also agreeing with them. You know, we need to start looking at the future. I mean, you know, you want to put something in now that Later on, we're going to change again, and then it's going to cost us again. You know, like like what happened with the SunPass. You know, they did half half fast lanes, half toll, and then they came back and said, oh, well, the fast lanes are better. Then they did, oh, no, they, they, they double dipped at the end of the day. That's what I see it. But we're going to do it. Let's do it right the first time. And I want to add that. Okay. I agree. Okay, so um, what we were hoping to do today was to go through the materials for the workshop. Um, that's still our goal here. So keep in mind that all of this is preliminary and the additional information you have before you with the little boxes is kind of the voting that we're going to be doing at the workshops themselves. The workshops are going to be organized not in this kind of a setting and not with me presenting. It's going to be a station to station and that's why we have station number two that we had and then he's going to load them one by one. We're going to go to station three next. But the idea is people will come in, they'll sign in at station one, so it'll be the sign-in table similar to what we have today. But then we will take little groups of people as they arrive and move them into station two, which is the recap, so they get familiar with the information, all the way through to station eight. So we actually have eight little activities, well, actually six activities, where we will be asking for their input. So just like we're asking you today, uh, we're going to have and hopefully like an assembly line of people moving through the room, going from station to station, learning about the project, ask, get, and getting their input, and, and asking them for their opinion on what they've seen and what they'd like in the future or what they currently think about it. So uh, the next station would be station three. So imagine yourself, you've signed in, you have the recap. We would then do, um, this would be a, we're gonna have a board that presents the basic information about our corridor. Um, and we'll have someone there to help orient people on where they are. So what this is, is a flyover of, um, put the, yeah, okay, sorry, right to the spirit. And so we've done basically a Google Earth flyover. This will help people orient themselves along the corridor and what we're talking about. So it starts off at the Bayland South Station and it identifies the corridor in, in the light blue and then it proceeds and this will basically be looping throughout the entire two hours that we do our, our, our workshops. Um, and again here it's just basically to orient people as to where the corridor is, what the features are, um, it basically identifies the key street crossings as we cross them, and we try to keep it at as, so here comes 104th Street, which is potentially the location of our first station. And people can ask questions, they can orient themselves, they'll be able to see where they are on the corridor in relationship to where their places of business are, where, they're, where, they're, where they do their shopping, where the Falls Mall is, and so forth. So I'm not gonna run through the whole thing now, but the idea was to, the idea here is to give a basic orientation to the corridor for those people who either aren't totally familiar um, or at least to understand you know kind of a bird's eye view of what we have in terms of land use and, and where the various developments um, come into play. Is that something that will be interactive that they'll be able to zoom in and out of and to loop back and forth on? And it's, the station location? it's set up to be a continuous loop so um, if they wanted to see something, I think, yeah, we could stop it probably and pull it back. It's just a video. Because I'm sure that people are going to be more concerned with areas more specific to them. To them, Rather yeah. Than obviously. Spending 20 minutes to watch it loop through. Um, yeah. Because if you can show where the stations are, right, the potential, one thing that I'm still unclear of is where are the potential stations? Okay. Right? How close will that access point be for my neighborhood? Right. And, you know, I'm sure people are looking at it for how it's going to impact each of them. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's something we could we could look into. We can make that happen, so that it's more interactive. We could stop it and pull it back. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? That was a pretty easy one. But yeah, no, those are good suggestions. Okay. Then um, 
Then we move on to the land use station. And, and this is again, as I mentioned, um, Mr. Alex Davis here to, you know, we'll, and he'll be at our meetings, I suspect, as well. And, um, but uh, we've, we basically want to present kind of the existing corridor. Yeah, I know, it's, it's hard to get it without any light. But, uh, so these, these, this isn't complete yet. The map looks the same because it is. It's the population map. We don't have the employment one done yet. We're still we're working on getting more refined data um, to be able to present uh, as good information as we can. Uh, part of the challenge is that the general mapping information tells you where, where jobs are, where, where, how employment is for people living along the corridor. And we need to get that um, remixed information so we can get actual places of employment that are right along the corridor. And we're using a half mile radius for this, uh, which is the way the Federal Transit Administration looks at projects. From a transit perspective, this that first half mile that's most important. So um, we would show basically the density of employment and population. Um, we're then, we then just pick 184th Street as an example um, to be able to show people what you're seeing here is essentially the half mile circle around the, around it in the in the green ellipse. Yes, I have a question. Sure. Um, part of the analysis is growth right. and how that's going to affect the corridor. Yes. Do you have some maps that project future growth as well of employment and population? We show examples of what happens when you do land use changes to get the growth around stations that's coming right up after this. Okay. Yeah. Because there are th things that we know about already, yes. plus things that are... Right. So, this is more... We're just showing the location as a general location for now. There isn't a lot of analysis here, except for the fact that the red paths here is actually how far you can walk from the station location, assuming it's there, that's the distance that you can walk in any direction to be able to get a half mile away. And so what happens is a lot of area, as you'll see up in here, and parts of the area here, are really, even though they're within a half mile radius, they're not really accessible by walking. So that ties into where you can site development, so, and where redevelopment could really happen um, in a way that people could walk to, which would be right here. John, hmm? um, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand this. Are you presenting the agenda for the public out input meetings? Yes. Then, then, okay, well that's great, but what's the function of this committee here now? Isn't that what's important? Okay, why, yeah. Why, well, why are we here? You're here to review the stuff that we're going to be presenting to the public as well. We're, the, we're the, not here to make recommendations on alternatives? Yes, when it comes time to do that in the process. I mean, we anticipate this committee to be through the life of our project. So I think your input's going to be invaluable as we move forward through the entire process. But we're nowhere, we're barely at the stage of developing the alternatives. So we don't have the information to share with you to be able to make a rational decision. I know you have your ideas on what that should be based on the studies that were done previously. But we don't have the information to give, like the facts uh, uh, that were discussed earlier. He's right. You know, what are, what are the traffic impacts? What are the what are the uh, what's the actual potential ridership we could get from these alternatives? We don't have that information yet. Could you lay out the schedule of how often they would meet in the public meetings to assist and answer? Yeah, I could, we questions. could talk about that. Um, from the, uh, I'm thinking when we recapped it, we talked about next meetings and the schedule. Um, but once we got through our stuff, we just, there's quite a bit of stuff to get through here. But we, we were thinking about every quarter, essentially, every three to four months that we would get the committee together as we develop information for the project. Can we make some suggestions tonight about what kind of studies and analysis we would like to see at the next meeting? Absolutely. Okay. Can I make one now? Sure. Could you produce traffic impact studies of the current four, is it four or five alternatives? And another one for the, um, for the, uh, um, 
alternative four? We will have to work on that with the county to be able to produce that information, but i um, not sure we could get it done to you by the next meeting, but we would certainly work diligently to get it done as quickly as we could. Right now, we've done an analysis of two intersections from the traffic perspective and found that the upgrade situation actually doesn't hurt traffic either on the cross streets or on US-1 at an aggregate situation, yeah. And, but basically, it's a very truncated, just we did the two test intersections for the moment. We have not done the entire car. Do you know what those two test intersections were? Yeah, there was a, remind me here, it was 104. And 152, yeah. 152 in US-1. There's 152 in US-1 and we, and 136, we did them all. Yeah, we did them all. What we thought were the two were, 136 and 152. Yeah, and we could certainly share those results. So um, as the commissioner was alluding to earlier, we, we looked at um, try to around the country where places have made land use changes to increase density to create transit oriented development and these are some before and after shots that we'll be sharing with uh, with the group as well yes. so in, in Portland um, before they did their streetcar system primarily streetcar and light rail I was saying where am I getting the feedback from And so this, uh, again, this shows the before development and the Portland's really had a major amount of development over, over really close to 20 years that they've had their system in place. Uh, what happened there? North Hollywood, which is still in planning in California, but this, this takes the entire um, area. And this is interesting because this is, it's below ground, but this is the same situation that we had at Dayland South. Um, this is the underground station of their metro rail connecting to a bus rapid transit station right here. And that's where the bus rapid transit would be and they're looking at development all around it. And then of course we will show our own, Dayland South, which is a great example of how a before and after um, can be with transit development. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that that, that is the change that happened. So yeah, so we're definitely trying to get to um, to show the difference and to show how how density and land use changes work together with transit improvement, um, how the general kind of you know process and this is where you know I think the work Calvin Giordano is going to be doing is more focused on um, this kind of interrelationship of land use with transportation solutions and the workshops and and charrettes they'll be holding uh, are going to be key to develop that land use plan and the land use planning all up and down the corridor that would essentially support what we're doing on our project and vice versa obviously. and then we're going to ask the public for their opinion um, which is one of the sheets we have before you we'd like yours too um, so if, if you could mark up those sheets and we'll collect them that way we'll kind of have a sense of you know pick one which one would you like to see in your area or along the corridor now probably all four or are ultimately going to be um, selected in different areas, but just to get a sense of, you know, is is the Dayland South large story development like that something that's considered acceptable, or would you really want to have it more medium or, or lower density in those areas? So if you could take a moment and mark up your sheets, we would appreciate that. It's anonymous. <laughs> And what we'll be doing is, we got this and several other questions, and we also hand it out. Um, as we go through these station areas with the public, then we will be collecting that information in real time so that people can see the results um, as they vote for different things. And so we have 50 votes for this and 20 votes for that. At station eight, we'll be recapping all that information and feeding it back so that the public gets a chance to see where, where things stand. You want to crank up the next one? Mm -hmm. 
The next station is to compare the various transit modes, the four alternatives essentially in terms of technology that, that we've selected. And it's a little hard to read here, but um, essentially it's the rapid transit service and we try to provide as much information as we do have available, even though it's relatively still preliminary. Um, so this is where we talk about how long the, the, uh, the line is themselves, how many, uh, what's the distance between stops so that the, um, for example, the RTS, we're saying is about a half mile to as much as two miles. I keep pushing that back on. Um, and that goes up to, with a heavy rail alternative of one to two miles, um, where because of the need to be able to move a train faster, you need to have the stops further apart. You really can't stop that often. Uh, we also do have some preliminary costs there, so it's a range. So we're, we're pretty clear that we'll fall in, in those ranges, and I think we do. Uh, the RTS is 200 to 250 million. Uh, 500 and 900 we we're giving for the light rail transit. Uh, the reason for the higher end on that range is primarily we don't have light rail transit in the county right now. So you would need a dedicated maintenance facility and you must buy all brand new vehicles. So that could potentially increase that cost. They did almost as much as doing a heavy rail extension, which we're showing again as a range from 700 to 1.2 billion. And uh, the connected autonomous vehicles, that's the biggest range. We're really not sure. Um, you know, it depends on how much of the reconstruction of the corridor that would entail and, if, uh, and, and how the vehicles are actually handled. Autonomous vehicles could mean converting the existing bus fleet to be able to efficiently run them like trains where you have three or four vehicles grouped together with one driver in the first vehicle and the others are just following along because they're connected electronically. Sure. These revenue total capital cost per million there, is that for the whole? Yes, that's the entire corridor, yes. Okay. All 20 miles. All 20 miles, exactly right. Yeah, that's why there's another reason there's a range, because it's 20 miles. So, Can right. Can I ask a question, Olson? Mm -hmm. On the connected autonomous, uh, there's some potential revenue that is being contemplated, right? Or you were talking this morning about possibly running it, it says shared lanes. So maybe you want to describe what you mean by shared lanes. Um, semi-exclusive. Yes, okay, the shared lanes means that we would uh, incorporate the autonomous vehicles onto the transit way. So they would share lanes with, with transit, whereas... When you say sh uh, share, you mean like privately operated autonomous? Privately autonomous, yes. Okay, so there right. would be a, a merger potentially of the two, right? which would potentially have a revenue or not? No so revenue. No revenue, so just no. you had... No toll. Right. <laughs> okay, okay. No. Uh, I have a question. It's, it's just sharing the space. You said, be, or somebody said before, that the elevated, um, the cost, estimated cost for the elevated one was, and for option four, I don't know whether there was a calculation to all the way to Homestead, was in the order of $2 billion, is that what? Uh, okay. I actually did the cost estimate in large part for the North Corridor in 2006 to nine when I was here before trying to get that built. Our cost estimate in 2007 or eight dollars, a little might be a little off of the year, was 973 million dollars for nine and a half miles of elevated rail. Did that include the, the right of ways? The no right. Very, yes, there was right of way in there because we were bouncing from side to side, but it was maybe 200 million of that. And that was in 2007 or eight dollars. Our year of expenditure estimate was $1.4 billion for that same project. But you did have- Which was this year, which was like 2015. Well, you do have savings in, you don't have to have a new maintenance facility. You don't have to yes. buy new, new rail cars. Yes. Uh, Up to a point. If we're the first car, oh, oh, we're obvi good. Obvi obviously, obviously. <laughs> yes. But you do have yes. certain savings along Absolutely. the line. Absolutely, right. So that's why that's not a two plus billion dollar estimate. It's, it's half that or less. Okay. Okay. Preliminary. Now there is another advantage that is 600, 450 to 600 passenger capacity per train. Yeah, absolutely. Rather yeah, than absolutely. 100 to 300. Absolutely. So 
Absolutely. You, you need a lot less. That's why these are the four alternatives. That's right. You need <clears> much. <throat> you, you can handle um, your potential passenger loading with a rail transit vehicle, either light rail or heavy rail, much more efficiently than with um, single unit smaller vehicles. So that's true. Okay. Yeah, this is an important slide, and we suspect there'll be a lot of discussion over it. But it's just this station just has this one um, one facility, and again, we ask for their opinion. What do people like? What would they like to see? So fill it in. Make a suggestion for the purposes of presenting it to the public. Is there a way to present what's currently there? Because it's not like nothing exists. We have a busway. Right. So you know, in evaluating what we have. You know, for us to know how much better our rapid transit system is going to be, it'd be helpful to see what does that busway do for us right now. How many, you know, stops do we have? How long does right. it take? How many passengers can it? That's can true. It, so. We could we could have an existing operation component to that. That's that's actually a good idea. And my apologies to the gentleman next to you. I didn't say what the current travel time is. Sixty-five to seventy minutes today. Uh, with the buses that are being run, depending on the schedule. And we try to, uh, we're hopeful that with any improvement, even the aggregate improvements, we can get a 10 to 15 minute reduction. And our goal is to get an hour, basically, to downtown. So we'll get close. We may not be exactly at or under an hour, but um, certainly with a metro rail alternative, um, we would be, it, right now it's 20 minutes from Dayland South to downtown. And so to do the 20 miles, we're hopeful we could do it in about 35 to 45 minutes, depending on um, how well we could get the traffic signals to work, which, by the way, are being upgraded to controllers that can allow full preemption. And our assumption is that you would have to have the full preemption for whichever of these alternatives in order to make it work at grid. So that when a vehicle comes, it goes through the intersection. Even if we're going to be rich on buses, roadways, uh, we still have to know the main thing is safety. Number one, absolutely. The safety at the crossing. Fifty-six grade crossings. There's a safety consideration, and then there's, for me, a full evaluation of how long it's going to take for the trains to pass, whether it ends with any given headway, and real time, how long are those crossings going to be blocked uh, as we move forward? Or right. It's not going to vary that much for the different alternatives, but what are we looking at in terms of blocking the roadway for the vehicles, for the transit vehicles, and again, the related to safety issues? I, I think this committee, from my standpoint, know these things before we decide on any uh, option. Absolutely. I co completely agree. Um, in terms of the, the frequency and the headway that we were anticipating, um, we had that in the chart, but I'll, I'll go over it briefly. Um, for a good bus transit operation, for a good RTS, the rapid transit service operation, a five-minute peak hour headway would be awesome. If we had a, a vehicle that would come, pick people up every five minutes, you wouldn't have to worry about a schedule. It would all be just, the, the vehicle comes, you missed it, ah, uh, another one in five minutes, that's fine. So that translates into 12 interruptions per hour, per direction, if we were to give it full preemption with gates, and that's essentially what we analyzed within the two intersections. Uh, for an RTS vehicle, it would probably be about 10 to 15 seconds. For a heavy rail vehicle, it would probably be on the order of 30 to 40 seconds. Wait, wait, longer because the heavy rail vehicle is, it takes longer to get through and needs more um, a longer clearance interval before and after the gates actually go up and down. I'm, I'm really confused. You say it's going to take 15 seconds for the gate to go down in advance of the train coming, for the train to go through, and then for the safety margin before it goes back up. With a train, it's more like 30 to 40 seconds. For an RTS vehicle or for your standard single unit transit vehicle, it would be shorter because it's only the one vehicle. 
I dispute those things. Okay. Yeah, we have a video of it from uh, St. Louis, I think, has it. Oh. Uh, and it's actually clocked. So, oh. at some point, we'll be showing the video to all that. Yeah, we won't have it for tonight, but mm. we can oh. let Jared's videos out there. We just got the video of ours, yeah. Okay. Um, one more comment. Sure. Mr. White mentioned something very important, and that is safety. And that's another re request that I would like to make to a safety analysis based on the DOT, the US DOT procedures for calculating not only um, uh, collision frequency, but also severity. Oh, somebody's keeping notes. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the next station is our station comparison, and this is another important one where we'll start showing what the stations could look like. And at the end of this is when we'll show the RTS video, actually, um, to you all here. So we try to keep certain features common to all these alternatives so that there's a certain level of service and expectation that people could have regardless of the mode. So we'll have a shared, the bicycle and pedestrian path that's there today would remain under all alternatives. Emergency vehicle access, we intend to maintain that as well. Uh, we're looking at center platforms for all the transit alternatives to make it easier for people to have just go to one platform location and know where they are. Don't have to worry about north or southbound and worry about crossing the street. They can pick up a train in either direction. Uh, improved lighting, improved transit station amenities, and we would improve the intersections with safety enhancements, obviously, for all these alternatives. That, that's already was very much in the forefront of our thinking as well, that safety is a big deal. So um, this is the presentation of the rapid transit service alternative with the station in the center. And um, again, we're just basically showing the basic facts about the station itself. Um, it's showing that it's widening out at the station area from the existing single lane in each direction but at stations will have the ability for vehicles to pass each other so that we can also introduce express service um, as well as uh, every stop local service essentially. Um, we would also accommodate the existing stations on the busway today, there's, there's 30 of them. And so we would not eliminate any stations with this alternative, but we would preserve those stations, make an improvement so that you would have essentially a local station on the side for the local buses that would continue to use the facility and for circulators that could enter into the facility from the neighborhood surrounding the station. But you have the center platform station for, um, for the rapid transit service. John, mm -hmm. in that last slide, sure. how do you access the center platform by crossing the Transit way? You cross the transit way at the intersection, yes. It's, it's single loaded from the north side in this particular case. So it's hard to see there, but it's actually you, you, would, you, you would come across the intersection. We have a rendering of it that shows it a little bit better. Um, this is a metro rail alternative, and you'll notice here that the platform is, is higher. It's, it's not as low as the RTS. The RTS is essentially a, a <coughs> 6 to 12 inch curve. Here we need to go to 43 inches to accommodate it, and it introduces the overhead contact system, which is the poles on the two sides, right there, to power the system. And it would also need some space probably at the back of the station for the traction power substation to be placed. So again, the intent here is to try to show the differences among these four alternatives. We'll have these side by side, so they'll be easier to see when we show them in the, in the public setting. Uh, the same thing with the light rail alternative. In this case, the station platform is basically the same height, and, but the dimensions are smaller. So if you go back to the metro rail, you notice the platform is a lot longer and it's a bit more truncated with the, with the light rail alternative. It doesn't have to be as large as the metro rail would require. And then for the connected autonomous vehicle alternative, we've identified the, um, a potential area where vehicles could stop for, if they were autonomous transit vehicles, um, and we're also showing that it's going also to a continuous four lane section so that we could introduce uh, autonomous vehicles that, so they wouldn't interfere with each other similarly to the way we had the RTS so that vehicles could pass each other without impeding their flow. 
And so that's basically the four alternatives. Sorry, quick question on the CAB. Yes. They're presumed to be electric? Yes, they are, excuse me, they are presumed to be electric and we have the recharging, the ability actually to have like spot charging at, at this station here. And we changed, uh, basically at the stations, the other component would be at the station, we have to figure out a way to, I think we need to put something like that back in that bubble diagram, where we show that you could actually park vehicles and they could locally stop like a kiss and ride function or a taxi stand autonomous vehicles that would be circulating through the neighborhood to bring people from the transit system to their homes. So you could be at home, you call up your app, an autonomous vehicle driverless picks you up and takes you either to the station where you then get on the RTS buses or, or any other part of the transit system, or they could just continue as an autonomous vehicle to your destination. And I'm sorry, were you talking about how those uh, routes would be determined for the circulators? Was that part of your presentation? Uh, not this stage again. That's probably something we'll do later. So when later we, you might ask yeah, for input as to exactly. where that would best right. work. We're we're also going to have down the road alternative workshops where we'll be looking. We'll we'll have laid out more detail on these alternatives, and that would be the best time I think to talk about the circulators and the details of how that feeder network ties into this main spine of the busway itself. Um, okay, before I go to the video though, let's just, we've done, so this is what a typical station would look like. Um, again, the station design itself is subject to community input, your own input as well. But the intent is it's a center, center platform station. And that's, as you can see in the top photo, um, in the top, the, the crossing across the street would happen at the normal pedestrian crosswalk to obviously be enhanced. And we would have covered walkways extending on both sides, but the center station here, we're looking at from the back end here, would be an air-conditioned space that would um, give a lot more comfort to passengers waiting for the RTS system on a daily basis. Excuse me, how many people would that hold? It looks like small. That's fit, that's actually the platform is uh, 12 feet by 120. So this counting the walls, it would hold probably about 50 people comfortably in the space of about 100 feet by 10. Did you mention those would be air conditioned? Yes, they're, they're, the plan is to have the, the center station air conditioned, not the outside, but that center, this, this structure in the center would, would be air conditioned. It would have, Next, but all of the stations would be upgraded with next next uh, next vehicle arrival information and. Um, What's the time interval uh, between the fifty people entering, mounting, and the actual people going on? Well, it, it's at each station, so um, the passenger loading per station typically right now is somewhere on the order of ten to twenty, maybe a little bit more in a few of the key stations. I've seen maybe. 20, 25 people get on at one time. So it's, it's, it's not spacious, but it's, it's reasonably comfortable and we can size it to what we expect when we get our ridership numbers and, and a per vehicle time. We can make it a little bit longer, certainly. We can't widen it, but we can make it 120 feet, for example. Before you actually get on the on the system, you prepay just like you do on Metrorail. You you have a ticket vending machine at the station location, and you go through fare gates. Once you're in the enclosed area, that transit vehicle comes. You can load through any door. It also has level boarding, just like the trains now, where you could just step. You you don't need to step up to to your transit vehicle. You just walk into it. So it has a lot of features that help you speed up the boarding and deboarding process as well. Right. Another question. Um, you're assuming that people are going to walk to it. Um, most, most people are going to have to probably drive to it. How do you account for cars, parking lots? We have park and ride as part of the project directly, and there are other park and rides that are in the process of being development. The commissioner mentioned the Tiger Grant. So we are applying for a um, 15 to $20 million grant from the federal government 
to pay for a park and ride facility at 150 seconds. At each seconds. one of these stops? At a, that one is for specifically okay, 150 that, that seconds. Okay, but right. eventually that would be... Eventually, yes. We Right now, we're, we have nine in the overall system that we're either uh, that are either existing, or you know, brand new ones, or or that are in the planning phases. For example, Homestead is doing a multimodal transfer facility on its own in Homestead, right at right at the facility, right adjacent to it. And um, so, yes, absolutely, that's very important. A lot of people will drive, and we, we anticipate that. And so, park and ride is key. John, uh, would they have bathrooms? Uh, because one of the biggest problem I see is uh, uh, no. people are. Yeah. Using it, uh, no. I mean, but in it's this, not conducive to a lady to take no. a. Uh, uh, in, we would, that's one thing. We are anticipating having restroom facilities at the terminal station at 344th Street, and, the, and there are facilities at Dayland South today. But the interim stations along the corridor, honestly, there just isn't room to be able to fit at all in this configuration. Is there any uh, way that we can, this committee can obtain? Uh, what has happened with the busway in terms of uh, how many accidents we have had? Uh, because we're we're talking about the same intersections, the different modes. So I would be uh, helpful to see how. Yes, we can absolutely pull that together for us. John, a, a suggestion. Since, as you said, nothing is off the table. Nothing off the table. Could you add elevated platforms and elevated stations to your presentation so that becomes a uh, uh, something that the public can look at? As you mentioned, look at that, a nice segue. We actually, um, well, we're going to try to make this look a, a little bit better, but if we were to do a grade separation and have elevated segments, there are some, most of those would require an elevated station. So um, essentially, this is what it would look like at the Falls Mall. And uh, we've, we've got some of the facts about it. So it would be about a 3,000 foot long structure. Uh, the height would be 20 to 25 feet. There's some variability there. Obviously, it goes up and down at, 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 the, at, at both ends. Um, and it's about 54 feet wide at a center platform location, which is right here. That's where the center platform it would be, the center station. And it actually can get to be a narrower structure as you're heading further down to about 35 feet. So we were planning on showing this as one of the options. Is the, is the length of the structure from one end of the north ramp to the other end of the south ramp? Correct. Okay, and at 20 feet over 3,000 feet, I, my math is slow, that's a 1.5% grade? Uh, for it's a three percent grade. Three percent grade. Yeah, we're we're we kept the structure to be able to accommodate metro rail trains, which the requirement that Miami Dade County has is three percent. Okay, let me make a few comments about about that. The power for to drive a uh, car uh, up a ramp doubles for each percentage of grade. So mm -hmm. the cost of the cars is going to be much more expensive if you have ramps going up and down. In addition to that, um, there are some intersections on this 20 miles that are within 3,000 feet of other intersections. So, and I don't know about 136th or 132nd, but what that would mean, uh, and in fact, I, th I think we're looking at it now, uh, it means closure of adjacent uh, crossings, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. What hap what's happening here is we are crossing 128th Street, which is just off the map here, and then we start to go up. So we're still crossing at grade at 128. There are no grade crossings between 128th and 132nd, nor are there any between 132nd and 136th. Um, we then go up, we then continue on, and then we can get this ramp down just after the um, canal so, that, that runs along the southern edge of the Falls Mall. So 132nd Street is either a tunnel through the ramp yeah, or it's the, a closure? No, it's ele we're elevating and keeping 132nd and 136th Street open, but we're elevating a longer distance here. And so, yes, yeah, essentially it's a, it's, a, it's a bridging over. The, the rail line bridges over the roadway in both cases. Um, and, and you're right, though, on, on one of our 
uh, the location up by Marlin Road and 184th and 186th, we have to go over all three because we can't go up and down and get back up in time. Okay. So have, some of them are longer than this. Do we have a estimate for cost of these of these particular structures? Yes, we do. That's a great answer. Do you know what that is? A lot. They're about thirty-two million. In that range, ten up to ten to thirty per, million a piece. Per, per structure. Per structure. And how many structures would you anticipate that we would need? Seven, six or seven. So we're looking at two hundred plus million dollars to do this. And you can put that in right. your name, it's an elevated I'll pull that with you. And so, so it's almost it would almost be cost effective just to elevate the whole the whole. If you're if you were going to do a lot of these grade separations, yes, all things, everything else being equal, then you may as well stay up, right? And and to me, it seems like because of the impact that mass that the, that the transit way is going to have on the immediately adjacent and parallel US one, that you're going to have to have a lot of these. So why not? Make it elevated all the way down to Southland Mall, and at some time in the future, make it elevated all the way down. In other words, I think our mayor is an advocate of a phased uh, uh, build on this, and, and I kind of agree with him. I think we need to do a phase one to Southland Mall, and then after we have exhausted the widening of US 1 and other uh, uh, roadway infrastructure uh, projects, then we can continue Metro Rail down to Florence City. Okay, that's all right. Uh, if I may, to the list of things that you might be checking for us, could you also include the potential for queuing on the US 1 as these trains go by and what's going to, how you're going to handle the, the backup of traffic uh, on US 1 as well as make that to a lot and, and the adjacent crossing? Well, the signals are basically being coordinated with US-1 and the busway as, as they're being installed now. And so it will optimize um, the traffic flow for both the crossing intersections as well as the adjacent US-1 one traffic. Um, honestly, that's not really the problem. The problem will be, and I agree, the challenge is the cross streets because that's where the most of the interruption will happen. Um, the queues would increase for some of the turning vehicles, obviously, when the vehicle comes by, but, um, you know, think of Biscayne Boulevard up in the northern reaches um, where the, it, it basically the, the rail track is immediately adjacent to, to Biscayne Boulevard. Um, John, let me make a comment on the signal coordination. If, if you have a busway, obviously you can do exactly what you're talking about. You can coordinate the two because the bus shares right of way. It doesn't have right of way. Rail owns the right of way. There's going to be trains coming through in both directions and those lights must be coordinated with the crossing bars and those crossing bars are not going to happen at a regular time based on the few seconds or minutes that the trains are late or early or whatever and it's going to be different for each intersection because the, crane, the trains are going to cross at different, at different times at different intersections. So I, I disagree that you can uh, uh, optimize traffic flow on US-1 when, when the US-1 lights are coordinated to a rail crossing. And, and I, will, I will give you a reference if you like. It's called the uh, Rail um, uh, uh, Traffic Handbook produced by the U.S. Department of Transportation, which spends a chapter on this, on this exact subject. On this issue. One thing to note, with the, with the, especially with the Metro Rail alternative, it doesn't really apply to the light rail alternative, but Metro Rail alternative service would be limited to the existing system configuration. So what that means is we couldn't have a train more often than every nine minutes if we were to go with the Metro Rail alternative. Why? Because it has to fit into the two-track section that runs from Dayland South to Arlington Heights. They're not going to build a third track. So the time limitations for the corridor, together with the rest of the smart plan corridors, assuming the other, like the North Corridor and the East-West, become also Metro Rail extensions, we have a time limitation of nine minutes on our corridor. They all do. They're all the same. 
because you can only do three minutes in the trunk line, minimal. So you can, each of those external branches need to be no more than nine minutes. Now, now but that's okay because we have a much bigger vehicle, so we can handle 500 people at a time. You, but you confused it's, me a little bit. The existing elevated metro rail has two tracks everywhere, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So what's this about one track? I don't understand. No, no, no. It's, we, we're not going to build a third one in that main trunk line. Good. So by direction, we have a three-minute limitation the way the system is designed. By design, the system can not put a train through more or less every three minutes. Three minutes, 20 seconds, maybe two minutes, 50 seconds, but it's every three minutes for safety reasons, for train separation, for the operation of the, uh, of the overall system. So we would not have as many trains as you're saying. We would have no more than nine, every one every nine minutes, which is seven trains an hour. So. In one direction? Each direction, yes. So nine, so that's 18 per minute. 18. About 15, about 15 trains. I'm sorry for to interrupt you, but for now you're being very patient. And to keep a much more, much more generalized <laughs> scope rather than a lot of details here, right? Yes. So, um, the overall intent, right, you guys, and you referenced it earlier, is, hey, if we go with a different option, there's a two-year minimum wait in order to do the federal uh, environmental studies that are required. Correct. Right? The most optimistic start date that you guys have would be uh, if everything went very simply and you just went with the most simple option without doing it, what's that, what's that time frame that you would say, okay, we're going to start doing changes in construction? If we could start, if we, if the slate was clean and I, we could start January 1st, let's say, or the, towards the end of the year this year, right? So let's say January 1st of this year, it would take probably about a year to procure a design build procurement and then uh, two to three years of actual construction time. Okay. So we're probably looking at three to four years for operation of one of the more of the simpler alternatives it, it will it would physically take um, any rail alternative is going to take more because of the staging that we would have to do in the construction and to maintain existing service so it'll take so longer a minimum of two years to commence construction and a minimum with the simplest options of two years of implementation for Correct. construction to open up what happens during that time frame with the existing busway um, and the ridership that is on there now right because then at some point depending on how complex we go with the system is going to add to a greater congestion because you're taking that ridership off of the busway for that time being. What are the impacts that that has based on the durations? Because I'm sure as we go elevated, right, uh, it's a great system. This is the next best option in my opinion, right? But as we go with those more complex options, it's taking people off of a busway that they're dependent upon right now and only adding to the congestion. Well, we would, we would actually work with the transit system to maintain service while we were constructing it. That's why I'm saying it would take longer for the rail options. Because okay. we could do the RTS improvements relatively simply. We would be building stations in the center. We maintain one side or the other, maintain traffic as we, as we built it. Um, it's a little more complex and it would take longer. We would still do that, though. We would still maintain existing service to the greatest extent possible because that's cutting our nose to spider fit. So. Okay, uh, we've done about a half hour overall, so I did want to show you the video. Where the video is. There it is. You want to, you got to click on it. This video actually was shown at the, uh, was it at the TPO meeting or at the, or both at the, TP, at the TPO meeting? Not this one. Not this latest no. one, no, no, but this is previously. Fresh, fresh off the press. Oh, this is a brand new video. Brand it's new not the video. same one, okay. Specific to the South Core. 
Chris Pratt got off of Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Give him the mic. Yeah, we'll do that. Give him the mic. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> if I could say something about this. Absolutely. Yes. So I just want to be clear that the when they show the pictures of the existing buses, right. that is not RTS. So right. they're trying to sort of combine right. the idea of the level boarding, prepay, right. uh, signal prioritization, all the other amenities. But the when we show those yeah, the existing buses, buses are showing some of the problems, actually. Showing some of the problems. Right, because okay. you, you can see people loading from the front door, for example. Right, exactly. The you no longer have to worry about that. You can get on and right. off any right. door, and that's one of the key okay. benefits. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood, because it, it was sort of a little um, combined, the modes and the video. Right. Okay. Um, so then we have one, one more station to, to go over, and uh, which was the funding overview that we'll be presenting. Um, since funding, where's the money coming from, right? Um, so we're basically doing a, um, a showing the capital improvement federal process, the capital improvement grant process. Um, this is what actually you go through with a with a new starts or a small starts process to get a project approved through the federal government. It looks like it's kind of short, but this is where a lot of projects can take quite a bit of time to get through the federal process. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but primarily is that they're trying to do these across the country 
and compare projects from Miami to Chicago to LA to New York and Boston. And they are trying to put it all on an even keel so that we have to follow these very specific kind of constructed process of ridership and development of cost. And we're doing that. We're actually doing our cost estimates in the process that is approved by the Federal Transit using their spreadsheets so that we already have all this information as much as possible so that we can easily submit something uh, to the federal government and we can check it as we go to know if we're, um, you know, how close we're getting. One of the key things that I will want to share with you as part of our studies, certainly for the next meeting, would be where our different alternatives fall. If, if we were to go to the federal government today, how does a rapid transit project fare? How, how would the federal government rate it? How would it rate a light rail project? How would it rate the heavy rail project? And that's very important information, I think, for making a decision on, um, on which alternative to choose. So that's definitely, um, you know, there's a trailer for stuff that's definitely coming next. Um, we also talked about how they do the rating, so individual criteria rating. Um, we were thinking of actually doing more about the, the cost process, but we think that might be a little overkill as such. So we kind of left it to these two in terms of the process that's followed by the federal government and how they actually do the ratings. And uh, the key thing here is that the local financial commitment is 50%. So the local money that is generated by the county and or by the various cities sitting at the table today um, and any other sources, including Florida DOT, um, goes to giving you 50% of the project rating. All of the technical stuff, the environmental benefits, congestion relief, all that, that's only worth a, another 50%. So getting the financial commitment is really, really important. That's really the, the, the message here. Um, and then we asked, you know, well, in support of that, to generate more local funds, would you be willing to increase the sales tax another half cent? And something else we'd like you to vote on, too. <laughs> on your little sheet. Go ahead. Um, Sorry. I wasn't, I wasn't aware that we were going to talk about financing, but I have some ideas on financing also. And I think that one of the reasons that we're in the situation that we're in now is that the county, um, not including our wonderful commissioner that we have here today, has given the developers a free ride. Uh, we have no impact fees. Uh, there, sh there should be for every new development in the transit area an impact fee that can go towards this local uh, uh, commitment. And, and, um, uh, and, and I would like to suggest that in the alternative form <coughs> where we have uh, elevated metro rail at half the cost because it only goes half the distance, that we commit to an impact fee for the, for the transit area that is on a per residence basis uh, that would help to leverage the local um, uh, option or the local commitment for the second phase, which is from South Bay down to uh, Florida City. Um, it would take some serious political will to do this, and it would take serious political will to not raid that fund for general services, but it might be a viable way to raise some money to make sure that the second phase happens and not have to wait another how many years 30 years for the for the next phase to happen in our in our mass transit that's just an idea okay i mean that's certainly it's a, it's a you're right it's a lot of commitment it's a huge policy decision and it's beyond the scope of what we are doing directly but it's something that we could consider absolutely well as well it's a it's related but not the same is the tax increment financing that is proposed along the, the corridor to utilize any future value uh, to, to pay for the corridor. You're talking about a special taxing district? For future development. It's yes. <clears throat> kind of like it's not a new tax, it's the value, it's the future value right. tax or the right. increased value. So it applies to, it's essentially a development impact fee with a different name, essentially. No, I hear your point. Any other? Oh, sorry, the gentleman. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I live in the island of Bayshore and did a, a survey. Uh, 
in, in the area, and we put the question out. We had this question uh, when, when we sent the first time, I was put the question out, and majority everybody, 82% of the, of the 100 people that got surveyed uh, voted against this, said no against it, because of course they have still the, uh, the past experience that we used to have a sand, and we didn't use it for anything else. Now, when we changed this, uh, after speaking with them, and, and we changed the wording on this, and then I said, well, what happened is, instead of asking ahead for the have a sand, we asked it afterwards. So we built first the, uh, the system, and then we asked for a sun stat, and out of everybody, out of the 100 people that, uh, that got surveyed, 72 said that they would agree with it. So basically, it's a form of you build it, and then we pay for it. Now, based on that, have we considered doing a treaty, the uh, private, uh, public, uh, what is it? Uh, public private private partnership. partnership. Because if that's the case, if we're able to build it and show them that we did our part, I don't think that people have that much of an issue accepting an additional house and tax. So I don't know if that's something that Commissioner Cava has talked uh, to the commissioners about. Again, that's something that is been being discussed by the county overall. In fact, the PPO has I can tell a lot of If you give this to people that day, everybody's going to say no because of the experience that we had before. So if you really want to think about that, try to think of changing the language and you know thinking about it, doing a treaty. Yeah, oh, that's cool. but, um, one, do we know what the fare is going to cost? The fare would be the same as the fare on the existing system, whatever that's going to be in the future. Okay, then uh, we have a couple of reacts to look uh, future information. I like to see if we can get a, um, a study or, or some kind of number where, where once, or let's say, you know, once it, it starts, you know, you guys start collecting, where would it be where the what you collect covers what the operating cost is? And never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. Doesn't do it anywhere in the world. It covers about twenty-two percent. Hmm? New York City covers fifty-eight percent. Okay. No, twenty-two percent is about average. New York City is the best at fifty-eight percent. You're not gonna do better than that. I'll let you know. I, I, I know the trends. Um, and then one more question. Oh. Um, somewhere I, I, I don't know. I must have missed it, but I never heard of a two-phase spark one from. Pendle to South Grand Mall, and from South Grand Mall, the second phase to Florida City. I've never haven't been aware of that. So we yeah. should start from Florida City to South Grand Mall. We, we can start at the, the bus Maybe that way should be better. Because, because, because of what the, <laughs> what he said earlier, the half cent, the half cent that we paid, you know. That, that's what I'm saying. Okay, it has to be a unified system. Right. No, no, that's true. I'll clarify. Come on. Well, if you can clarify that, then I'm going to say. Okay, well I'll clarify it. We have a study from Dadeland South to Florida City. We are looking at the entire that's corridor, that's so right. we're not going to stop halfway. That's right. There are, that's uh, what's on the table is, yeah, we could, we could work with, uh, you could do light rail in one section and heavy rail in the other, or flip it around. That's, that opportunity, I think, still exists like everything else. Nothing's really off the table. We just didn't want to go back. I think really what's honestly off the table is a fully elevated metro rail system. It's over two billion dollars. It's got to be. Even if, you know, no matter what we do but, but with the answer, latest technology. If you, look at your, if you look at your video, the answer is there. No, no. You have showed roadways for your BRT, what is it called now? Yeah. RTS. 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 Yeah, that. So, let me go back to the goal of the whole exercise is to get people out of their cars. By considering this project separate from the feeder system of how you're going to get the people to your system you're working on here is doing half the job. You wouldn't need that huge monstrosity we proposed at 136th and 132nd, exactly where I live. If you look at your feeder bus system and you integrate a system that goes into the neighborhoods, makes it convenient, where you have maybe depots through the neighborhoods. I've talked to Monica about this in the past, and it's done around the world. 2,500 square feet, no parking. You can get dropped off, you can take your bicycle, your skateboard, you can walk there. Dropped off, and it would have air conditioning, maybe a 
bacteria, whatever, and then you your feeder system, that at that depot you could have the feeders would come in from the neighborhoods, your BRT buses could have a, a loading ramp there, then they could get on this busway, this, this uh, expressway. And so unless you consider that as a whole, how, how you're gonna integrate it and how it's gonna work, you're gonna, you would build systems like that and not have consider how you're gonna get the people there. And the main thing is get the people out of their cars. If you start building parking lots at these stations, you in a way you defeat it. You still have people in their cars. They gotta get there. They gotta come across Kendall, they've gotta come from all over. If you take the system and distribute it out into the neighborhoods and have your capillaries and arteries coming in, then you you don't need those kinds of things. And the other thing is that if you don't have restrooms at these stations where there are people there, you, you're, you're dead before you start. It has to be convenient, it has to be safe, it has to be comfortable, it has to be sexy, it has to, you know, you've gotta consider these things if you're gonna get people out of their cars. And you know, if, if I may, you know, I, we should have a, like a, either a half day or full day workshop so that we can really hash out our concerns and, and, and fight out some of these things if this committee is gonna be anything more than a rubber stamp. I second that. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify a couple of points. Uh, there was a set of um, financial projections that were put out at one point by Alice Bravo, the Director of Transportation and Public Works, that looked at portions of the corridor. So that's where the idea came in. But that isn't what is being worked on. It doesn't mean that it couldn't come up, right? But it's not as was described. Uh, also, the video was prepared by the Department of Transportation and Public Works and is not the necessary future. It's a vision that they're putting out. So I just want to be clear, you know, it, it obviously is trying to be compelling and show you the advantages, but it doesn't in any way preempt the discussion right. of this group and the, and the public's input. So I think, you know, to Barry's point about a longer meeting, you know, that's up to you guys, the planners, but I guess the point is, is you're having this discussion, you're seeing, I mean, I'm seeing things here, most of it I know, but I don't know all of it. So there's always advancing and more data. And then you're helping to shape what the presentation will be to the broader public. And then you'll, it'll come back to you, as, right. as I understand it, to mis, you know, to, to understand, interpret what the public said, and then give guidance about moving forward. So uh, just wanted to make those couple May I, may I very briefly comment on what Barry said? I, I, I agree with you almost 100%, but I disagree with your goal, and that is to get people out of their cars. Uh, the goals are mobility, and I'm very pleased to see in your um, presentation that you address accessibility. I think personally that accessibility is much more important than mobility. What's the difference? Accessibility is the ability to get quickly to your job. There's no law that says that the jobs have to be in downtown Miami and we have to live in Homestead. We can have jobs in Homestead. We can have jobs in Cutler Bay. And Cutler Bay, and, and this is not anything new. In the 70s and 80s when I was young, that was a long time ago, there was a plan that came out and said, we're gonna have regional centers, and the first regional center is gonna be Dadeland, and the next one is gonna be Southland Mall, and these are gonna be areas where people can live, work, and play. And, and if Southland Mall was developed similar to what Dadeland is today, then the people on the corridor that are coming from Homestead could stop at Dadeland Mall for their jobs and not, not crowd the roads uh, north of there. If, and not only that, if there were jobs at Southland Mall, the people could get from Pinecrest, could get on the transit system or on the highway and go south in the morning. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could distribute our jobs? And wouldn't it be wonderful if somehow we could pick up the ball on these regional centers and, and get, get traffic so it isn't all in one direction in the morning and all in the other direction in the other, but it's evenly distributed. 
if we could if we could get traffic going in both directions we could extend the life of our existing in infrastructure by years so I think that this has to go hand in hand with with transit and with uh, uh, highways and with mobility we, we have to also develop accessibility and and I, it's not what we're here tonight to talk about but since uh, Daniela is here and listening I thought I threw it at her too but and I did not um Forgot to mention to the point about the connectivity to the neighborhoods. Uh, John said that that will be the subject of a future workshop, and it's critical. Just I, mean, I, I yeah. by the way, I'm sort of a broken record on that topic, and if you follow me, you know that's what I've been talking about for a long time, and it could not be more critical because the last mile is, you know, the first and last mile is essential to a function. And it has to be at both ends. It can't just be. Yeah. It can't just look here. And that aspect of the entire smart plan has to be, I think, considered globally with all the plans, with all of the things, because unless we bring sophisticated the feeder system throughout the county, no matter what you do with all these other things, you're wasting time. Unless that feeder feeder and you can begin that now. You don't have to wait until all this other stuff is done. You can begin, that's, some are already in place, some communities have already done it. Planning is 90% of everything. You can take what you have now, start working on that feeder system, which will automatically improve ridership and make it more comfortable. You don't need to reinvent the wheel to do that now and begin to work on it countywide and that will affect all six of your uh, I just plans. must tell you that I'm working on that all the time mm -hmm. and we had a meeting about it this morning and completely agree and not only that we it, it, it builds up the ridership for the yep. future and that was the point that I made so we're, we're all right Mary, we'll keep yeah, talking about right. it because we need advice about how to inform the department about it okay can I make one more suggestion I'm sorry you want to yeah um, um really quick on the, um, I know I know you said that uh, about the elevator system but on the elevator system if we actually had it on the table right now wouldn't that kind of like um, take away already the concerns that Mr. Way has for safety and Mr. Zucky has about the traffic? Because with that, an elevated system, system would, that, right? would have the least impact, uh, the least interaction, so obviously. Why are, we, right. why are we feeding on Twitter? Because I think we have to go through the exercise of seeing how ridiculous an airframe system is, and eventually it will we'll prove to ourselves that it's untenable. Um, a, a, a comment or actually a suggestion in terms of getting us information in my reading and research prior to coming here tonight uh, I read in the uh, US DOT's uh, handbook for rail uh, crossings that they recommend no new at grade crossings so this is a recommendation by the US Department of Transportation so the questions that I have that we, I think, need to answer before we go too far ahead with these grade at grade uh, plans is, will the US DOT approve uh, at 46 or 56 at grade crossings uh, and or will the feds uh, actually fund a system that has 46 or 56 new at grade crossings when their own DOT recommends against new right. crossings and they make the recommendation which is yeah if we could build without doing grade crossings that would obviously be a lot better but projects are approved all the time with new grade crossings all across the country so the same can we get <laughs> can we get uh, um, uh, some kind of confirmation from the u.s dot that these great great plans are viable we will be developing our uh, work with uh, the Federal Transit Administration and going through the process with them, so they'll have a lot of input. In if we proceed down the path of doing the light rail or the heavy rail option, absolutely, they'll be very involved, and they'll give us their input right up front. Just a comment on the on the survey question you're going to give out to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, I would suggest that you add heavy rail in there instead of because you have rapid, light, and then metro rail. You don't have the term heavy rail, but all your presentation says heavy rail. I assume you're assuming you're Metro rail is heavy rail. But I think you should get on service. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also That's a good I idea. Yeah, it should be consistent. And it says at grade emphasis. I, I realize it seems like we're being walked that way, but shouldn't we be asking that too? Would it, would it not at grade? Elevated. Mm -hmm. 
add, add the question. Okay, we'll add the question. <laughs> We're down to 10 minutes, so um, we, obviously we do have some additional, there, there's one additional survey that you all got handed. Um, we didn't pull it up as such, it's not on our, in a regular presentation form, but it's, it's the one that has eight questions. Um, and so it's an attitudinal survey that when they get to the final station and we, we get their results, they're seeing the results as they went along the way. We're going to ask everyone, and we actually have this on a survey monkey um, real time um, question that people could scan the code and take the survey. They'll be getting that as they sign in. Um, but we'll also have it in a, in a hand written, in a hard copy format for those people who are more comfortable with filling it out old school. But we'll also have it as a survey monkey. Sure. I'm, I'm confused with question number eight. Is the word worsening a verb or an adjective? It, it, it says avoid making traffic worse avoid or making, avoid roads where the traffic is bad. That's what avoid making is. traffic worse. Okay. That's the better way to say that. Thanks. So it is a verb. Thank you. Well, but you're suggesting that they change the word, right? Yeah, no, yeah, he's right. Let's let's make it English. I agree. <laughs> Avoid making traffic worse. Um, I may have missed this while we were focused on the options being presented, but how does the public know about these public workshops as they show up? Okay, yeah, they, um, we, uh, Sharif, do you want to explain that? Yes, um, at your seat you have an agenda. On the bottom of the agenda, you'll see the public workshops that are listed. So for the public, we will advertise in the newspaper as well as direct mail. We're sending out direct mail to all of the property owners along the corridor. So that will start next week, and then that's how they'll be notified. Also in the past, the elected officials also posted the information. The organizations along the corridor, we emailed them the information as well, and we asked them to 